This lecture is about conversion. Now, <clears throat> conversion is a tort uh, intended to protect your possessory interest in property. For example, if I am possessing some property and walking along the street, I don't want people to come and simply dispossess me of this property. And if people do that, I can bring the cause of action for trespass to chattel. And that's the way in which the legal system protects my right to possess the property, trespass to chattel. But uh, we have a special rule for historical reasons having to do with the law of Trover way back when. We have separate rule for when the dispossession of the property has been so serious that instead of suing for trespass to chattel and getting damages, the person should pay me the full value of the property. Okay? They should just pay me the full value. And that indeed is the way conversion is defined. Conversion is defined, and you should know this definition, as uh, the exercise of dominion and control over another's property, which is so serious that it's fair to make the person pay the full value of the property. It's fair to make them pay the full value. Now, I know we say forced sale and all that stuff, and that's okay, but we're talking about the way the code reads. Look at the restatement section 222A, and what it actually says is that when the interference is so serious that it is fair to make the other person pay me full value, that's when conversion happens, and that's the way you want to write it for examination. Now, of course, when the person pays me full value, the court's going to give them the title to the property. And so you think of this as a forced sale. But please do your analysis the way the code reads, which is the conversion occurs when the interference has been so serious. The exercise of dominion and control over my property has been so serious that the person who did it should, in fairness, pay me full value of the property. That's when conversion happens. And, uh, so, and, and so you can see that the value that the pay person should pay me then is the value of the property at the time and place when that conversion took place. And the conversion took place when that exercise got to be that serious. That's the instant when conversion happened. And therefore, the value at that time and place is the general rule for what I can get for the conversion. Now there's some complications with that. We're going to talk about those in just a minute, but I want you to see the big concept here. Uh, so we understand what conversion is. It's when, I, when the exercise is so serious that it's fair to make you pay full value, and you see a serious problem there. How do you decide well, that, that line uh, between when is the exercise of dominion and control so serious that you should be required to pay me full value? Okay, uh, well, that's a, that's a problem. How do you decide that? And that's a large part of what the law of conversion is about. Also, when, uh, if uh, uh, someone, let's suppose me, suppose I convert your property, okay? I steal it, for example. So I convert your property and I've got it. There's no question you can sue me for conversion, but what about when I distribute this property out into the population some way? I sell it to a bona fide purchaser, I donate it to somebody, I give it to somebody by will, somebody else steals it from me, and so forth. So as this property moves its way out into the population, uh, what about the liability of those people out there? Where does that liability, who is liable and who is not? And so that's a second significant problem in the law of conversion. First, do you have conversion? Was the exercise serious enough? We need some rules about that, and we will have them. Secondly, who is liable as, you, as the property gets distributed? Who remains liable and who doesn't? And then thirdly, when you, when you find a person that is liable and you sue them for a conversion, uh, what do you get? Well, you can, we said that what you, it's, uh, they should pay full value at the moment of conversion. But you know you got a problem there. 
Because what do you do if uh, they converted my diamond ring? This person converted my, it was worth $1,000 at the time they converted it. I sue. By the time we get to trial, it's worth $2,000. This person sues it and gets the $2,000, and they pay me the $1,000 because that was the value at the time and place of conversion. Well, that doesn't seem fair. They just made a profit off of stealing my ring. And so you don't necessarily always, you have, have problems there with what, what do you rec uh, recover in cases where the price fluctuates, cases where the price is stable, it's not a problem, where the price fluctuates, you've got a problem, and finally you might even want to waive the tort of conversion and not even sue for conversion and sue in quasi-contract, that is you're suing to prevent the, the crook's unjust enrichment. So you treat it as though when the crook sold the diamond ring for $2,000, they were acting on my behalf, kind of as my agent, and I get the full $2,000. So those are the issues that come up in the law of conversion. Do you have conversion at all? Uh, was, the ex was the interference serious enough so that you really have conversion? Secondly, if you have the conversion as the property moves out in the population, who remains liable and who doesn't? And thirdly, when you sue for damages, uh, what do you get in these cases where you have fluctuating uh, value? or you may want to waive the tort and sue an assumption. So let's turn then to the basic question of uh, do we have a, uh, uh, did the tort, do we have conversion? So first keep in mind that conversion protects possession. And we have Two causes of action which are used to protect uh, 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 possession. And those are, number one, trespass to uh, chattel. And this comes from just intermeddling, so to speak, with the property and conversion. And conversion is defined at the restatement 222A and it's defined as uh, uh, exercising dominion and control over the property to such a serious extent that the person who did it should be required to pay full value of the property. When they pay full value, the court will, of course, give them the title to the property. Uh, and so how do you decide whether the exercise of dominion and control has been, is serious enough? And we look to a number of factors to do that. And these factors are in the restatement here. And the factors are, well, one factor is how long, if the person uh, dispossessed me of the property, exercising dominion and control over it, how long did they do that? That certainly is a factor in deciding whether or not we've got conversion. And so uh, the, time that, the time or duration, that certainly becomes a factor. Another factor that you might use is was the property damaged uh, while the person uh, had it, while they were dispossessing me of the property? What, did it get damaged during that time or lost or destroyed? Another factor is good faith. Did the person acquire the hat by accident, leaving the restaurant and got the wrong hat on the hat rack? Or when they acquired it, were they trying to steal my hat at the time? So did they acquire it in good faith? And finally, uh, the victim's inconvenience. Uh, or expense. So these are the factors which the restatement cites that should be used in helping to decide whether or not the interference has been serious enough. And this is a major part of the law of conversion, being able to do that. Uh, I, the restatement itself, section 222A, has a number of illustrations as to what does and does not constitute conversion. And I've seen bar questions come directly from these illustrations. For example, there was one bar question where a person's furniture had been stored at a furniture storage place 
and they went to get the furniture and the people in good faith thought the bill hadn't been paid and so they delayed uh, for a day or so while they were trying to get that straightened out about the bill and during that de short delay period the warehouse burned down and the furniture was destroyed. Do you or don't you have conversion in that situation? Right out of these illustrations. And so I'm going to read to you these illustrations. There are 26 of them all together uh, and you need them. Uh, this is where bar questions come from and uh, you need to see how these factors are used. First illustration of 222A of second restatement of torts. On leaving a restaurant, A by mistake takes B's hat from the rack, leaving it, uh, believing it to be his own. When he reaches the sidewalk, A puts on the hat, discovers his mistake, and immediately re-enters re the restaurant and returns the hat to the rack. This is not a conversion. Illustration two. The same facts as above regarding the hat in the hat rack, except that A keeps the hat for three months before discovering his mistake and returning it. This is a conversion. You see the big factor there is the time that the person uh, kept it. Illustration number three. Same facts as above with regard to the hat, except that A reaches the sidewalk and puts on the hat and a sudden gust of wind blows it from his head and it goes down an open manhole and is lost forever. This is conversion. Okay, again, you see the property was destroyed. This factor is the one that's being emphasized. Next illustration from 222A of the restatement, illustration four. Leaving a restaurant, A takes B's hat from the rack, intending to steal it. As he approaches the door, he sees a policeman outside and immediately returns the hat to the rack. This is a conversion, and you see why? Bad faith. Illustration five, A takes possession of a house and finds B's furniture inside the house. A removes the furniture to a storage warehouse, stores it in B's name, and notifies B that he might come and get it. Okay. This is not a conversion. Illustration uh, six, same facts, same furniture in the house that A is moving into, B's furniture is there, uh, except that A removes the furniture to a warehouse at a distance so that B is subject to great inconvenience and expense, inconvenience and expense okay, in recovering the furniture. This is conversion or a conversion. Example seven, same facts as in uh, above, where the person uh, gets the furniture, takes B's furniture in the house, A takes B's furniture, this time he takes it to a warehouse and stores it in his own name with the intent to keep it for himself. <coughs> this is conversion. Next one, same facts except that it was stored in a warehouse uh, uh, and uh, before B could come to remove it, it is destroyed by fire in the warehouse. Okay? That is conversion. Okay? This is the, remember that in, in, uh, 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 that in five, what had happened, this is important, that A had removed the furniture from the house and stored it in B's name and notified B that he can come and get it. This is not a conversion. But if that furniture got destroyed before B could come and get it, it is a conversion. That's what this illustration is telling you. Um, um, illustration nine. A, a ships goods using B as the carrier, and A shipped the goods to himself. Uh, the, uh, by mistake, B delivers the goods to C, and B discovers the mistake immediately, and within 24 hours recovers the goods from C and delivers them to A. This is not a conversion. Example 10, illustration 10, same thing, except that the goods are not recovered 
and remain in the possession of C, this is a conversion. 11. A leaves his furniture in B's house with B's consent. B sells the house to C, telling C that the furniture belongs to A, and C agrees to hold it for A until A calls for it. B neglects to notify A about this transfer uh, for a month, but during that time, uh, A did not make a demand for the furniture. This is not a conversion. Illustration 12. A takes possession of a house and finds in it some of B's furniture. In order to keep out the intruders, A changes the locks on the doors, and as a result uh, of which, uh, when B came to get his furniture, he was prevented from obtaining it for one day until he could find A and get the keys. This is not a conversion. However, under the same circumstances where A takes possession of the house and finds B's furniture in there, and it says that he changed the locks with the intention of appropriating the furniture and preventing B from recovering it. This is conversion. Illustration number 14. A stores his car in B's locked garage. A comes to get the car and demands it. B intentionally delays a half hour in giving A the key to the garage. This is not conversion, the idea being that none of these factors were severe enough. Illustration 15. Same facts regarding the garage, except B delays for a month in giving him the key. That is conversion. You can see the duration period was changed, and that was enough to turn it into conversion. 17, uh, or 16, rather, the same facts as before, except during the half hour when the car was in the garage, the garage caught fire and the car was destroyed. That is conversion. You can see what happened. The damage element was increased dramatically. Uh, 17. A intentionally shoots B's horse. As a result, the horse dies. This is conversion. Same facts, except that the horse is, it was merely scratched and quickly recovers. This is not conversion. You see how the damage factor was changed dramatically, and it made the difference. 19. A stores his fur coat with B. Without A's knowledge or consent, B repairs a hole in the lining of the coat. This is not conversion. A illustration 20, same facts as above about the fur coat, but this time B alters the coat by cutting, down, cutting it down to size so that A can no longer wear it. This is conversion, and you can see that it is the damage element that was significantly changed. A illustration number 21, a entrusts an automobile to B, a dealer for sale. On one occasion, B drives a car on his own business for 10 miles. This is not conversion. 22. Same facts as above regarding the automobile dealer, except that B drives the car for 2,000 miles. This is a conversion. You can see which factor was suddenly changed. 23. Same facts as above except that the car dealer uses the car for illegal transportation of narcotics, and as a result, it is confiscated by the federal government. This is a conversion. Illustration 24, same facts regarding the car, except that B drives the car with the intent to appropriate it and to deprive A of its use. There you have it again. That uh, changes the, uh, the, the good, no good faith, change in the, uh, the good faith factor. And 24, uh, A rents an automobile to B to drive to City X and to return. In violation of the agreement, B drives to City Y, which is 10 miles beyond City X. No harm is done to the car. This is not a conversion. Nothing here is large enough. 26, and the last one. The same facts as 25 about the car going to City X and supposed to come back except that while the car was in City Y, which is only 10 miles away, uh, the car is seriously damaged in a collision. It doesn't matter whether B was negligent or not, this is a conversion. And you see because the damage element was significantly increased. So those are the 26 examples which are in the restatement uh, itself. I've seen them used numerous times for exam purposes, and I think you understand now how 
these factors. Time, was the property damaged, good faith, inconvenience and expense, how these are used to determine whether or not there really was a tort. Now, if there was a tort, if there was a conversion, then the next question becomes, uh, is, the, is the properties redistributed out the population, which of those people are liable for a conversion and which ones are not? And so our next issue here, if this is number one, this is our number two, and it is who uh, uh, is liable. And there are several cases that we need to distinguish. One is the case of the, of the thief. In the case of theft, if I acquired your property by, th by theft, I am the converter. Of course, you can sue me for conversion. But if there is a bona fide purchaser who buys the product from me, not knowing that I am the thief, that I don't really own it, that that bona fide purchaser, however innocent, is liable for a conversion. And all the people that get passed on remain liable as, as uh, converters. So in this case, where there's theft, the entire chain The entire chain remains liable. Second case is where the property is acquired by fraud. Now, when the property is acquired by fraud, uh, it's a little different because if I deceive you into giving me your car by giving you a false check, for example, I, I know it's a you know in, that this is a bad check, and I persuade you to give me your car. Well, when you did that. You actually gave me the ownership of the car. It's true that I deceived you, and that's the reason you gave it to me. But nevertheless, you, con you conveyed to me the title, the ownership of the car. And it doesn't have to have a document of title if I deceive you and give you a false check and you give me a diamond ring. You intended to give me the ownership of that ring. So I've actually got the ownership. And so now uh, you have a right to come and get it back, of course, uh, once you discover my fraud. But while I've got the ownership, if some bona fide purchaser comes along and I convey it to them, they get the ownership. Okay? And they're not affected by the fact that you could have sued me. So in the case of fraud, the, the, the bona fide purchaser terminates liability. There's no liability after that. And the bona fide purchaser is not liable in the fraud case, nor is anyone else in the chain. Of course, I'm liable as a converter. So in the fraud case, the bona fide purchaser terminates the chain of liability. And we have the except the, the bailment exceptions. And the, um, the bailment exceptions are uh, the, you, uh, the cases where, let's say, I, I stole the property. So there's no question you can sue me for conversion. And now I take it to a warehouse and I store it in the warehouse. Well, these people in the warehouse don't know anything about you know, the fact that I stole it. And in theory, you know, they, are, they continue to be liable because they're withholding property that belongs to you. And so if you don't do something about it, the people who transport goods, who store goods, all these kinds of bailments, that these people would be liable for conversion. So we have an exception saying if these people, these bailees, did not know uh, that uh, uh, I had a, that the property was converted property, they are not liable for a conversion. So we have this bailment exception. And you need that in order to have parking lots. I steal a car, I take it to the parking lot, the parking lot person parks it, they possess the car, you know, they'd be liable for conversion, but we have this exception. So what we know now is how to determine whether or not there has been conversion. We know a lot about how to use these, very heavily tested. Secondly, who is liable? The entire chain in case of theft and fraud, the first bona fide purchaser takes off, terminates liability, and the uh, bailment exceptions. So now, one final thing here that, uh, in this area, and that is that uh, normally you, need, you, you uh, convert uh, uh, tangible personal property. But there are some modern cases where courts are allowing documents to be converted where the document 
is closely connected with the, the right itself, such things as a stock certificate or an insurance policy or the bank passbook, for example, or uh, th those kinds of things, a bill of lading. Uh, if, you've, if something has come in from a ship and it's stored at the warehouse, whoever's got the bill of lading can go there and get it. And so courts have allowed the bill of lading to be the subject of conversion. So when a document is closely tied to the possession of the property itself, such as the one the examples I gave, the courts have allowed those kinds of documents to be converted. So our last category here would be that documents can be converted. I'll just put documents, yes. Documents can be converted if it is a document that is that closely connected to the possession of the property. Now, so this completes the, uh, was there a conversion? Who is liable for it? And we next want to look to the remedies for conversion. Now, the remedy The remedies for conversion are, first of all, damages and the damages are in really two parts. One is that the damages, the, the, the rule is that, uh, is, is that the, uh, that the, if the, the moment that the conversion happens, as soon as the defendant um, has exercised a, a dominion and control became serious enough that they should pay full value, at that moment, that's when the conversion occurs. And so when I sue for conversion, they should pay me the, the value of it at that moment. And so that's fine if you have a stable value. But what about the case where the value fluctuates? And so, again, as in my earlier example, person converts the diamond ring from me, it's worth $1,000 at the time of conversion. By the time we get to trial, it's worth $2,000, and all I would get is my $1,000. And Or I suppose the, the item went up and down in value during the period of conversion. It was one, worth one amount at the time of conversion, worth a different amount at the time of trial. And so uh, these damages then, uh, we have uh, the... Uh, you, you get the value, and the question then becomes, when do you determine the value? And normally is at the time and place of conversion. But what we should do is to do this so it's a little clearer. That is to say, if it's a stable value, then the usual rule is that the value at the time and place of conversion, and it doesn't matter whether it's the time of trial or not, because if it's a stable value. But when you have an unstable value, when the value is fluctuating, if you have an unstable value, the uh, now courts vary a lot about what you do about this. In my example of the diamond ring, some courts would say that uh, I can collect the highest value between the time of the conversion and the time of trial. Some say I get the value at the time of trial. Some say that uh, uh, I get, you, you look at uh, the value at the time I became aware of the conversion and the highest value between then and the trial. Some say, well, the highest value between the time of the conversion and a reasonable time for me to uh, replace the item, a reasonable time to replace. And so when the value fluctuates, we've got all these different possible rules, and what you can do is just point out to the examiners that states vary a great deal in that case where the value is unstable, and here are some possibilities, once it matters. And then finally, consequential damages, such as use, for example, because during the time when I discover that my item has been converted, and, and even if I'm going to go get another one, give me a reasonable time to go get another one, I've got loss of use during that period. And so uh, many jurisdictions will give loss of use, and others will say, uh, like California says, that uh, any harm that was proximately caused by the conversion, 
not just use, but some say any harm that is approximately caused. So those are the damages you can get, but then comes the final case where you want to waive, waive the tort and sue in quasi-contract. Okay, and this is the case where the diamond has now, is now worth $2,000 instead of $1,000 at the time of conversion. You don't want the thief to keep the $1,000. And so what you might do is to say, forget it, forget about suing for the, for, for the uh, value of the property of the diamond at the time and place of conversion. Uh, I want to treat this, this thief as though they're selling it on my behalf and they got $2,000 and give it to me. And we do that to prevent the person's unjust enrichment. And so I want you to do this to prevent the unjust enrichment. And you can see how that can happen. And then finally, the, uh, uh, the, there are reasons to do this. Is, uh, sometimes there is a uh, procedural advantage. as possible. Uh, these procedural advantage, for example, if you sue under quasi-contract, it's basically kind of a contract theory. And if you're suing on a contract theory, you get to use the contract statute of limitations. Whereas if you're suing for the tort, you use the tort statute of limitations. And that may turn out to be something that's important. So that is what you need to know. It's everything, I believe, that you need to know about conversion. What we do know about it now is that how to decide whether or not conversion actually happened with lots of examples where these factors are used. Uh, we know how to determine if, if uh, conversion happened. We know who's liable out the chain. We know that documents may be converted under certain circumstances. When there is conversion, you want a remedy. Uh, if you go for uh, the value at the time and place of conversion, it's, it's a stable value, it's not a problem. If it's an unstable value, you've got lots of views as to what to do about it. You also can get consequential damages such as loss of use in some states, say any other harm that was proximately caused by the conversion. Uh, and finally, you may want to waive the tort and sue in quasi-contract to prevent unjust enrichment, and it may also get you a procedural advantage. That is everything you need to know about the law of torts. I think it is very clear from uh, what we have said. And that is the end of this lecture.